What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Um, before we start, please hit subscribe. Please give us a review once you've listened. Keeps the podcast going. Um, yeah, that's about it, really. Podcast time. Uh, this week, uh, I have singer, songwriter, producer, um, live artist, a uh, lady called Joplin. Um, she is a Berlin-based artist, makes really, really nice, emotive, beautiful dance records. Um, she has released albums. Um, she has only been on the scene since 2020 from what she spoke about in, in the uh, podcast. She's been writing music for a lot longer than that, but she's very, very talented um, and I love her music. So I thought I'd get her on the podcast. So without further ado, Joplin. Joplin, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, really good. I am saying your name correctly, right? Yes. That's the main thing. Joplin. Exactly. Like Janice Joplin. Yeah, I was going to say, is there, is there like a link with that? Is um, She definitely inspired it. I was looking for names, which is such a hard thing to do. I think people always underestimate actually finding a name that hasn't been used yet. Yeah. Um, totally. And in my case, the name has been used. I mean, Janis Joplin isn't exactly like a indie niche <laughs> <laughs> artist that no one knows about. Um, but I figured because her music is so different from what I do uh, and because I'm so inspired by any strong woman. And I mean, she really, you know, pushed down the boundaries and everything in her time yeah. uh, that I thought it would be a great homage to her almost. And I do spell it a little different to her. Okay. I mean, I spell it with the Y instead of the I. And uh, yeah, so I actually got the idea. I think I was having breakfast and Janis Joplin was just playing in the background. Amazing. So it's all thanks to the Spotify algorithm. And then I was like, how can I switch this up a little? And that's how the name Joplin came about. Do you, that's amazing. Do you let the Spotify algorithm kind of do you do its thing? Kind of. I mean, it really? knows me too well nowadays. Like it's yeah. almost scary. Like sometimes I don't even have to type any anything. I just open up my Spotify and it tells me the song that I wow. like the exact song that I want to listen to. It's almost as scary as the TikTok algorithm. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that's like top tier. No one can beat that. I um, yeah. I don't spend long enough on TikTok for it to get me. Yeah. Like That's I, good on you. I haven't. Yeah, no. <laughs> I like. I gave it. I think a week, and then after that, it knew me too well. Now I can't put the app down anymore. It's, <laughs> it's crazy, especially because I remember like I used to make fun of everyone who was using TikTok because I was like, "Huh, I'm way too cool for this." Like, yeah, I'm still that. Kid. I'm still that person right now. But I'm. Oh, no. I. I post the last one standing. I post on TikTok, <laughs> but I like I post in Ghost, so I literally post okay, and leave. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you're more of an Instagram. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm older. I'm 32. So it's like I grew up with with Instagram. I'm not saying that I'm old, but like mm -hmm. I don't know actually. I mean, that's that's almost like Facebook in a way. Yeah, almost. I I How old are you if you don't mind me asking? Um or do we that's not, actually something I don't Do we not really, talk about? I, I can I can I mean you don't you never ask a lady her age, right? I can tell you but That's bullshit. Yeah, you, of, course you a, of course you ask if of course you ask a lady how old she is. Come on. <laughs> We're in 2022 now. Uh, but I am probably younger than you think. <laughs> no, I kind of thought you were younger than what I I have I th I have a feeling. Okay. I have an idea. Okay, you have an idea. <laughs> but yeah, I was going to say That's like great. I when like with social media like I grew up um when Facebook wasn't a thing. So it's mm. like I think the first the first thing was Facebook for me. No, it was MySpace. <laughs> um and then facebook and then instagram and then i guess twitter yeah, at the TikTok. same time oh twitter okay yeah I feel like twitter isn't a thing in germany at all like i Is never i don't none of my friends use twitter it's mm. more of like maybe an american thing or do people use it in the uk a lot i don't know yeah i think people use it here as well um mm -hmm. but i i think it's like i don't use it that i do the same as tiktok i post and ghost I yeah, just don't. that's the best way to do it. I mean, yeah. that was the plan initially for me downloading TikTok because <laughs> they actually wanted to like, the one thing I will say, TikTok is very on board with like getting more musicians, I think, yeah. on there. And like, especially the m music team here in Germany, like they're mm. very 
uh, involved in everything, which I couldn't say the same about Instagram. Yeah. So um, in the beginning, it was like, okay, I'm going to collab with you guys. Yeah. Like, we're going to bring more. We're going to make it more of an edutainment platform. Mm. Um, but now I'm just sucked into the sucked vortex and never coming out again. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think like TikTok's a wild... It's like the wild west of Insta sure. I mean, it's Instagram, so crazy right? because there's so many niches existing on TikTok, right? It's like, but you both like the two of us can be on TikTok and yeah. have a completely different experience of the app, and you're you're in such an echo chamber at some point. Like I saw this uh, video on TikTok of a girl. She was for two weeks. She was kind of reacting and like in interacting with the content, mm. like she thought like um, a, like deep America, like deep in America. Yeah conservative mm. maybe trump supporter would yeah uh, and like the videos that ended up popping up on her for you page mm. like on in her algorithm uh, after those two weeks it was crazy because it was like very you know sexualized women with guns and yeah, like yeah. all these like paroles that were very questionable um and you're like wow it's that's crazy that that's the same app and that like once you're in the algorithm that's just what you're going to be Fat. seeing all yeah, day, yeah. every day. And then that obviously shapes the way you think again and your views and everything. Um, so it's such a, I think it's really cool, but I think it's also a little, you have to, you know, definitely be careful about it. I have a little sister and like the niche that she's in, she's, she was on witch talk, I think a couple of months ago, which is like What's that? the TikTok for witches. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that existed. Me neither, but like, like I said, like it all happens like so far from anything yeah. you like you would talk about normal. Like it's just it's so so big, but it, mm. no one talks about it. And like, um, yeah, it's just like basically all you see is like videos of witches doing spells, and then they're like, if you have a mole on this arm, then you're a witch officially. Wow. And like, she was so sucked into it, and she began thinking she was a witch, um, and stuff like that, which is like. I don't know. I think it's definitely an interesting app to um, to experience. Definitely different to anything else. Yeah, I think I think it's there's like huge pros and cons to it, right? And I think mm -hmm. the the there is it's like the internet. The internet is a huge tool to make to to allow yourself to be whoever you want to be, and allow your niche to connect with them. Mm -hmm. but on the other side of it there's the rabbit holes and the the bad oh, yeah. side of it but realistically there's bad sides to everything exactly so it's exactly. like i mean it can be very educated like i nowadays like my for you page i learn a lot from it and yeah. like it's obviously not the most trustworthy source being like i, I learned this <laughs> on tiktok but like i feel like there is some very good quality just like knowledge out there mm. um that's been made very accessible very like put into like bite-sized little chunks where it's easy for you to, yeah. you know, process it. And like, that's what I love using TikTok for. And I mean, everything happens in niches nowadays. Like it's the same with on Spotify. It's the same everywhere. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. It's, obvious, but it's I, gonna be this one on TikTok. It's just the, the educational side of the internet is amazing. Like, I don't know about you, but for me, like just listening to podcasts over the last like five, six, seven years, I think I've learned more from a podcast from podcasts than I did at school. And I think it's like it allows the creative brain that doesn't necessarily do well in a educational environment to work out what their niche is and work out who they want to be with who they want to be in life. Exactly. <laughs> and I think yeah. like education doesn't uh, we, we all need the education system if you know what I mean. We're fortunate that we live in a country that we have that. Um, mm -hmm. but I think it's also the, it's very like, what's the word? I'm not too sure what the word is. Um, it's very like one track minded. Mm, and it's, it's made like for one specific type of person. person yeah. And exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, that's what I love about the internet too. I feel like in school, you're so often taught that learning is a bad thing and it's like, uh, like it's tiring yeah. and it's it's so sad because yeah. you know when we when we're babies or when mm. we're toddlers all we want to do is learn yeah. all we want to do is explore and like our brains are like sponges we want to soak up like every little yep. thing bit of knowledge that we can get and then once we get into school it becomes like a negative thing mm -hmm. almost and i think that's the saddest part about school is just that it teaches you that it's not cool yeah. and that it's not fun to learn and i think i had to kind of 
like when I got out of school, I had to remodel my brain into being like, this is such a privilege that mm -hmm. I'm able to learn all of this stuff. And like, it is the best thing I think in, in life to learn and to keep yeah. educating and to keep growing. Um, so I think like, I definitely agree with you. I also think it's a little like, you know, reducing a human being to a number from one to six in Germany. I don't know what it's like in the UK. Um, I have a couple friends and they were definitely like, it did a lot to their self-worth because at the end of the day, like you begin, you know, equating your self-worth to that number you get from one to six. Yeah. And like I had a friend and she, every teacher kept telling her, you know, you're stupid. And at some yeah. point she believed and she thought genuinely thought, okay, I'm stupid. You know, there's just no mm. way I've, I can even help myself. It's just, she kind of accepted yeah. this number that she got. And then she was like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do in life. Like mm. I, obviously I am too dumb to do anything. Yeah. So she kind of, I don't know. It was like a spiral downwards from there. And I think that can be a little toxic but maybe that was just also my school no that sure. sounds pretty rough to be fair when you're like graded yeah. <laughs> like this is yeah. almost like the like social system right and having social social kind of status and you will be in like it's very weird and you're i think to a certain extent like for me at school it was like yeah you're putting classes based on your intelligence um mm -hmm. and for me like in certain classes like the, the more academic I was definitely at the bottom but I think because I was fortunate enough to have people around me my parents my family um, family friends that would make sure that I that would support me through that as well mm -hmm. and I think if you don't have that support system when exactly. you're when you're a child it's which I was I'm very fortunate but like a lot of people don't have that and yeah. the mid they spend you spend more time at school than you do at home majority of the time because when you go home you go to sleep after a couple of hours and and then you're back to school five days mm. a week and i think <clears throat> that's the that's the thing for me is like i wish i'm not saying i'm massively generalizing but i wish there was like a, a, a way for teachers to actually like nurture kids and and realize that kids are the future of the world and and kind of but also the same for parents. And I guess going into that, I want to kind of go into your childhood a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to kind of dig into that a little bit. Because, <laughs> it's always when it, when it gets deep, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, but I think like... That's when it all happens. Yeah, you like it's very easy for me to just start talking about music, but like your music's great and we'll get into that in after. But like, I think like knowing how somebody's childhood was is like the reason why they are the person today yeah i feel like everything you can lead back to the childhood yeah like it's crazy yeah so no, you're right how was it my childhood i mean i grew up um i'm half vietnamese and half mm. german which is also like going back to school um my experience of school was kind of like my mom she's the german side she yeah. had a very healthy way of looking at school yeah. my dad who's the asian side who you would typically think okay like you know super school is the most important thing you can only bring yeah. home like a's or stereoty else you're gonna go. stereotypical asian dad exactly asian that's like yeah, the yeah. stereotypical asian yeah. upbringing and like the funny thing is that he got that stereotypical asian upbringing from his dad yeah and because of it he was so traumatized maybe traumatized maybe just like maybe it was just like an end like i get it completely yeah, yeah. i feel like you either become exactly like your parent or you become mm -hmm. the exact opposite and he ended up being the exact opposite mm -hmm. so he kept telling me like school is the dumbest thing like you don't need to be there like he would be when i was studying for a test he'd be like stop studying like this should have like so, wow so, you, can, you, swear can swear, you can swear you can swear okay swear. uh this is you know bullshit yeah. um do something better with your time you know can't you stay home tomorrow and like be creative can't you skip school tomorrow and I'd be like, most of the time I was like, yeah, I'll skip school tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but like occasionally I had like an important test or something, so I couldn't skip school. And I'm like, yeah. we had sometimes even when say arguments, but it was always like a thing also between my parents where my mom was a little bit more like, okay, I, I get it. Like school isn't mm. the most important thing, but it's still important. Yeah. And I think also her being a woman, like she still, um, like she was thought it was like, she knew how important it was for me to just have a diploma or whatever in my yeah, hands just to kind totally. of 
if the music thing never doesn't work out just to kind of prove that I yeah. got some type of education or mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and yeah, so that was definitely a little, a contentious topic in my family. Uh, I was not that much, not in school that much, but I was, um, a very good student nonetheless, you know, <laughs> <laughs> saying true to the, to the Asian stereotype. I did get good grades. Um, yeah. but my childhood in general, I mean, I grew up in a very creative household. Like <clears throat> there was always music playing. Um, I started learning, you know, how to play the piano when I was five, which mm-hmm. is also, it's amazing. you know, it's either the violin or the piano yeah. for me it was the piano. <laughs> and did your dad um, or mum play as well? Uh, my dad plays. Yeah, exactly. But it's like, I feel like every age, sorry, I keep going back to the, but I, I did have some like very stereotypically Asian parts yeah. of my upbringing. I get it. And like, that's another part that was definitely very, very stereotypically Asian. Um, so I got like the whole classical shebang, like a, mm. You know, I was, I had like a very strict Russian piano teacher here in Berlin. Uh, and she was, you know, giving me like loads of homework, like, you know, according to her, all I, all I was allowed to do all day is just like play the like, piano yeah, and yeah. like, exactly be chained to the piano. Uh, and like, at some point I was like, I'm sick of Mozart. I'm sick of Beethoven. Like I'm sick of all these like classical, like, I don't want to be a pianist. Like yeah. I, like, I don't, I think the way she taught it, like she taught me was not very, Again, like it was, it felt very forced, like it didn't really nurture the whole creative side of it. Totally. Um, so at some point I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I told my parents, uh, I don't want to take piano lessons anymore. Um, I just want to teach myself. Yeah. And then we go back to the internet being this like universe of knowledge. Yeah. So I really taught myself how to play, you know, chords and everything from like on the, off of the internet, mm. which is I obviously, I obviously had the basis of, you know, having been in piano lessons for five years or yeah, something. Yeah, you're already pretty good. I, like, yeah, I can read notes. Yeah, like, yeah, I can yeah. play. But, like, I, I never really got the whole concept of chords because that's not what you're taught in, no. like, you know, classical yeah, yeah, piano yeah. lessons. Um, what so are, I, you, what are like, you taught in classical piano lessons? Because I've had piano lessons, but I wouldn't say they were, like, classical I, I mean, that was just what my Russian teacher taught me, but it was yeah. basically like, um, first you learn how to read notes and then you just learn how to play like all these extremely hard, yeah. like pieces. that's all you do. Like you never really get the context. You never get into like the harmonics of it or like, why does this piece work? Yeah. yeah why yeah. does like, why is it in a major key and how does, you know, that support the theme of like, you never really understand the whole music theory behind it or i think mm. you're never really taught the whole music theory it's, it's more of like this is what you this is how it's played and then yeah. you know you have to learn a kind of like writing or like reading I it's actually like. really interesting you say that because i've never thought about this but there's so many people that play instruments that are great at emulating other people's music mm. and playing other people's music and that's all they do they yeah. literally go and sit in front of a piano, go and sit in front of, or have a guitar, whatever, and read notes and play other people's music. And I, even looking back when I used to have piano lessons, there was never a point of like, the piano is an instrument to make music, not to play other people's music. It's an instrument to go and like create. And let's spend. Then, I mean, if your strength is <laughs> emulating then it can also be a, just a tool for emulating. But yeah. in our case, I guess it is, yes. But I think, I, I don't know anybody that has had, that goes to get piano lessons that doesn't get taught. That You have to go through the basics, of course. And then when you get to a point, it's like, okay, how difficult is the music? Like, the, it's based on difficulties, right? This mm. this this piece is very simple to play. You, you get good at that. You then go to a, little harder 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 piece but it's never like let's go and go and create your own we've got an hour lesson today let's go and create something of ourselves and i think that's really i've never thought of why but i wonder why that is because I, I don't know anybody it's a completely different um like it's a completely, completely different field like i don't think any like no matter how well you can emulate or you know play finished pieces like that doesn't 
tell you anything about your ability to create. No, right? it doesn't at all. So I feel like piano teachers, you know, their job is to teach you how to read Play the music. Something. So it would be stepping out of their own com comfort zone to be like, okay, let's create it. That's such a different task to do. And I think it's like, it's like in real school, like you're the, like the, the default is always just to learn how to emulate and yeah. to learn how to quote all these important like literary mm. icons like and i don't know or like it's like for example in german lesson or in english lessons like you never learn how to write your own no. stuff you always just get these like long articles or, or poems or whatever and like you have to analyze them but mm. i feel like if school because at the end of the day what well, you need all what you do all this this analyzing for is to be able to i think um make produce some good work totally. of your own but you never do like you, the only work you produce is always based on Somebody something else's. that's already there yeah, yeah, right yeah. so like i remember when i was in um in school and our like i had a very cool english teacher and like she was the first one to be like okay we're done with everything i feel like the english teachers are always good Being right the english teachers well, it's generally because it's generally because they're just like on holiday or something like that for like a few years True. and they're just yeah, chilling yeah. <laughs> exactly they're just chilling <laughs> So she was awesome. And like, um, she, like she, when we were done with like all the curriculum, like stuff in the curriculum that we had to go through for the year, um, she was like, okay, like I, I could just watch movies with you until the end of this year, mm. which is what every other teacher would do. Yeah. Um, but let's just write some poems. Why not? Like mm. let's, but let's make it fun. Like I'm not going to grade them. We're just going to be creative and we're going to take the whole stress out of it. Like, this is not about, um, you know, being good or bad. This is just about being yeah. and like creating. Mm. And like, I feel like that's such a cool approach, but I had like no other teacher I ever had would have ever thought to do that. Yeah. And like even the creative subjects in school, you know, music and art in my school, they were kind of seen as like secondary. So mm. we would go like a year that we would have like four secondary subjects, uh, one, like chemistry and physics, I think on the one side and then art, and music on the other side and then yeah. one year would be just chemistry chemistry and physics oh, wow. and then the next year would be just art and music ah, so they weren't even like on the same level as yeah. math or whatever it was like yeah whatever we'll just like if we have the time slot to fill it like mm. we'll give the kids their art and music lessons and like i feel like that's like i think it does shape a society to be kind of i mean it's it's easier of course to control a society that's good at just like you know, doing what they're told, working, you know, giving, like being given a task and then yeah. not questioning it and just like working that task. Do you, and then, think, do you think that's a control thing? I mean, it sounds very conspiracy. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> down to go down that rabbit hole. So let's but go, let's like, go. <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm just putting it out there. It is easier to control people or yeah, just con control people that tend to think more inside of a box than people that are taught to think more outside of the box. I guess going back to TikTok and going back to algorithms, do you not feel the same? Yeah, for sure. Like the TikTok, like for sure. I mean, there is this conspiracy theory again that has um, that's uh, been saying that the Chinese TikTok, like when we open the app for yeah. uh, when kids open the app in China, it's like only like educational content yeah, that yeah, they're I've getting, that. Yeah. and then. Those same kids opening the app in whatever, like America or somewhere, somewhere else in the West, uh, they're getting all these dance videos and yeah. whatever TikTok's known for. And it is in a way dumbing down a, a society, I think, especially if you start mm. so young. And um, so I think it's definitely like social media now is the closest, like it's the interface, you know, where everyone, mm. it's the where it's the platform where everyone kind of, you know, connects and yeah. where those where we can, yeah, where we can communicate with our idols or with like-minded people or mm. whatever. Um, so I think that is really the easiest means to control society because that's where all the communication on all the knowledge and yeah. education happens at the end of the day. And I wouldn't see why people wouldn't take advantage of that. I don't disagree. Yeah. Don't disagree with that. What's, um, <laughs> what's the wildest conspiracy theory you're into? <laughs> I feel like you go down some rabbit holes. Like a big <laughs> yes, now you do. I have to say, I'm not really like. I wouldn't say I am. Oh, boring. 
I was looking forward <laughs> I know, to that. I'm like, I'm trying to think. But like stuff like, I don't know. I don't even know that many conspiracy theories. The last one I kind of heard about was the Bermuda Triangle, which is like ages ago. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm sorry to disappoint. I just have like my theories about, I think, social media and society and, and like society school. And how everyone's it. gonna get controlled by everybody. Yeah, and the robots are just gonna take take over at the end anyway. <laughs> this is actually true. I was I had a um I had a mate uh in the studio with me for the last couple of days and we were talking about AI music. And he's mm. he's a classically trained pianist. He's ex- insanely good uh jazz pianist as well. Mm-hmm. And he has a project that is p- like a purely piano music on Spotify. And he had the conversation his management had a co- had the conversation with him the other day that like there's literally ai that's creating music that like playlist music like background music like on the playlist mm. of like study and chill and that spotify yeah, like ambient, right? <laughs> yeah and that spotify are creating ai techniques or ai technologies to create this music so it then takes out the artist side of it mm. and we are at that point now where music, I don't think it will always take over, but music and art will be taken over by the robots. There, there, sure. there will be a point. Like everything else. Yeah. yeah. I completely agree. I mean, there was, wasn't there like a couple of years ago, the first algorithm, like AI that was ever signed, I think to Sony. Yeah. And that algorithm was making like this ambient music that was mm. perfect for all these Spotify like study playlists or yeah. whatever and like made so much just money and you know rights and everything uh, that it made sense for Sony to sign that AI yeah. and I think that now like nowadays I just I was just talking to a friend about it and she's working like in the AI field she was and she told me that the songs like because voices are now even so easy to emulate yeah. like it's not only no, no longer just restricted to ambient music, no. which I kind of, which was always easier for me to understand because mm. it does follow kind of like a pattern and everything. Yeah. But like now if you open up, open it up to all genres, like that's going to completely revolutionize everything. But I do think that humans want to see humans. So I think the music yeah. side, okay. Like maybe we'll have AIs composing hit songs or yeah. whatever, but I feel like, just like having a face to the music, having an artist to embody the music, to express themselves through the music and to communicate with their fan base. I think that's not going to go anywhere so soon. I mean, yeah. there are there are, are AI models and everything nowadays on Instagram too, it's right? Crazy. But I feel like this human element, like if it's too perfect, if it's just not real, like if it's too technical, I don't think humans connect with that the same way they do with real humans. I totally agree. And I was saying to him about um, feelings and how, like, realistically, can an AI feel real emotions? Because the emotions they are being taught are based on human Mm. interactions and what the humans are kind of teaching them. So it's like, I feel like music is very feeling based um, and how it makes the artist feel when they're creating it and also how it makes the listener feel when they're listening to it. And I think you need a feeling to start a record and to finish a record. And I don't know if you can emulate that, but no one... No, an AI has never been broken up with by their boyfriend or girlfriend, if you know what I mean. Like they've never experienced that feeling of like lostness or whatever whatever makes you write music or yeah. create art or whatever it is. And I think that's the one thing is that people will still want to connect with is that there's going to be tech companies. Wouldn't, such- you, wouldn't you say that like, I mean, there's so much content specifically about a breakup let's just say like lyrical content and like so much that any ai i feel like even if it's just regurgitating what's already out there like don't you think that that whole thing of feeling at least lyrically (coughs) yeah yeah lyrically and formulaically yes Mm -hmm. 100 but not as expression 100 but not as an expression and not like not being able to really feel that real like, yes, they're going to be able to make a record like Adele. 100%. They probably already can. 
and they can probably yeah. put Adele's voice on there. Like, let's we like with all the deep fake stuff, they can do pretty much anything. Is it really gonna ever be as good? I don't know. I don't know. It probably sonically, yes, but I I just don't think it will truly have that real human feeling. I think the storytelling is important, right? Yeah. I mean, Adele, like she, of course, her songs are amazing, yeah. but like the whole stories around them, um, just like the personality factor. Yeah. Totally. If that wasn't hadn't been there, yeah, I don't know if if they would have been received as like emotionally as they were. Mm. Yeah, um, I totally agree. And and I think for me, I don't know about you, but when I listen to music, that's all I'm trying to get is a feeling from the music or how can I attach that song to a feeling of or a memory or something like that? And that's kind of the only, if I'm writing music, it's like, how will this, how does this make me feel? And how do I want this to make other people's f people feel? Yeah. And in the moment yeah. or whatever like that. And I, I just, maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm jaded, but, or naive, mm -hmm. but hopefully I feel like in dance doesn't. music, it could be easier because it is such a, it's like, I always have this, I wouldn't say issue, but this like it's always a compromise, I think, between combining both artistic like expression with func just functionality, because at the end oh, of the day, like it needs to work yeah. on the dance floor. Um, uh, and I can see that like AIs, maybe that would make, you know, AIs making dance music a little more feasible than writing pop ballads like Ellie. Uh, I, I don't know. Adele don't, did. Yes. With who? I just said like Adele, like Adele. Does, Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I don't know though, because I think pop songs are very formulaic as well. You have like verse, chorus, verse, pre, chorus, or something like that. It's very like if you and if you listen to a lot of the pop records, they all use very similar chords. They all use like those power chords and it's very like the classic like boy band like they all have that like back in the like early 2000s they all had that key change after the first chorus yeah. if you know what I mean. it's just very formulaic um, yeah, yeah. But so, i think the storytelling as aspect is more yeah. important right yeah i totally agree and i think i just i hope they don't recreate that <laughs> yeah i mean we'll see we're fucked we'll see. if it does we are absolutely fucked if it does i mean i feel like before ai takes over like the creative like um field it'll take over you know everything else like automating i feel like anything else is so much easier to automate you know any yeah. other profession yeah so it's, it's i feel crazy. like the creative like sect like i feel like we might be the last one standing and then eventually maybe we'll also be taken over but <laughs> that's just my wishful thinking <laughs> that maybe yeah maybe that's the one thing that they can't take from us just yet the tech the tech but, world's mad i was i've got so, another project that i'm working on and it deals with AI it, to a certain extent. And it's mad what it can do. Like it, you can literally have a conversation with it. Like you yeah. can have a text conversation with it and I can text it and it can literally respond back how I want it to respond as long as you give it the right, the right messages. And you're like, ah, fucking, this is crazy. Yeah, exactly. And like the whole service industry like even lawyers and doctors, which are, you know, yeah. stereotypically like the safest jobs and like the safest, um, like things to go to college for and, you know, go into debt for. I feel like those are the first ones that are going to be just completely taken over. by. Do you AI think doctors will be? I think so. Cause yeah. I mean, would you rather be like, if it was like a, you know, like a very dangerous surgery and it was like, you had to be very, you know, take a very thin needle yeah. and like cut a very thin, like it's all super tiny. Would you rather have like a shaky six year old, like, you it's know, doctor's slept. hand yeah, 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 performing yeah. that or a robot <clears throat> with like ultimate precision and everything? Yeah. Like, I'd, I'd choose the robot for sure. I agree with that. But then I don't know, like, GP, like, general practitioner, doctor. Like, mm. I Google shit when I think I've got something wrong with me and it, always turns out to be the worst so it's like well, it just tells you okay you're gonna die tomorrow <laughs> literally <laughs> <laughs> so it's like testament, yeah so it's like do i trust a computer because all they're just going to be doing is googling and it's like oh you have this this and this it's you're that's true you're gonna die tomorrow but, 
I mean, I, I have like my cousin, she's a doctor and she like the stuff she tells me is like, it's so scary because yeah. she's like, most of the time, like, we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. Like, we're, just, <laughs> we're just trying to like calm you down. Like we have no idea. Just wing it. Um, yeah, exactly. They're just all winging it. And like, um, I did have a couple of, like, I had one thing where every doctor told me something else and in the end I did just Google and I found like, I ended up finding the one, I mean, it was like probably like a one, one in a million th- time yeah. thing. But like occasionally, like even through Google, you can self-diagnose and it is. Totally. And it is totally. right. Yeah, and it's like, mad that, isn't it? Because like you said, it's like you ha- lawyers, doctors, it's like still the go-to thing if you want a very successful or if you want a job that pays well and you will mm-hmm. be in a job for life, if you know what I mean. It's like the go-to thing. Um, but it's all going. Like there's in law, like there's, I know there's apps now where you can literally like, if you need terms and conditions made for your for your website, if you need some sort of like basic contract made or not basic contract, you can literally like go on a website and type in, this is exactly what I want and they make it for you. And you're just like, yeah. I think the difference is, is the level of trust is like it take, how long will it take us to trust that all of that is actually correct? Mm. Rather, and if there's a mistake who's to blame i feel like exactly. that's a big question yeah. like also with self-driving cars like if there's ever an accident with a self-driving car is it you know are you to blame for mm. like if you're in the car from giving the car the permission to self-drive yeah. itself is the programmer of the self-driving algorithm to blame like is the company to blame i feel like that opens up a whole new just legal debate about responsibility and blame yeah it's really interesting isn't it because i get I the whole self-driving car is really interesting because I think it will be f- amazing like when mm-hmm. it happens because I think I don't know I'm just plucking this out of thin air but I'd probably say 99% of accidents on the road is because of a human error yeah and it's very rarely the car error um and if it is the car error it's like you're suing that company in like one I know somebody who is a lawyer and he sues car companies for for mistakes that has caused fatal deaths or injuries mm. <laughs> yeah. and they yeah they sue them for insane amounts of money but like if you like i guess that's the answer to the question is who do you blame is like if it is the cars the the fault no one goes to prison mm. whereas like if you and i were drink driving we and we hit somebody and we killed somebody we'd go to prison so that's the consequences the consequences to the tech company is well they weren't drink driving and they weren't necessarily doing anything illegal so they're just going to get sued the fuck out of and have have to to pay pay a a shit ton of money money. yeah but in tech we all know that money is an endless pit to a certain extent so it's it's just a number on the screen exactly and yeah I think it'll be way safer though. For sure. And I'd I mean, love I, to be in I a car love... and not have to worry. Yeah. That'd be, I mean, it will definitely revolutionize like the whole transport, the whole topic of transportation. I, I also, who told me this? Like another friend, I think, told me that now they're also, maybe this is all just conspiracy, may not a conspiracy, but I don't <laughs> you know. love how, conspiracy like, theories. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> keep going <laughs> <laughs> i keep like pulling them out of you everywhere do, yeah but, like um they're working like a friend of mine told me they're working on basically like her company uh they're working on things where you can like little like jumping pads basically where mm. you can jump like 10 meters at a time no and they're way. like and it's like a thing where like i was like okay you're working on it and then 10 years maybe you're gonna like put out the first prototypes or yeah. whatever but she's like no but like we just put out the prototypes like this thing is ready like to go wow um and like they're trying to i feel like just how humans move is going to be so different yeah. even like 10 years from now maybe we're all just going to be jumping around in the air and like no one like we're not ever going to walk ever again yeah <laughs> and like yeah it was just kind of sad um but yeah i feel like the whole world world is about to change and you put the whole thing like yeah. if you bring like the metaverse into it then and then nfts yeah, yeah, yeah. and whatever like everything is just I feel like we're at such a like breaking point right now where it's like, we're like all these things already exist and they're mm-hmm. like, they're already like 
work in parallel to the real like to the world that we know right yeah, now the yeah, traditional yeah. world and then at some point there's just going to be the switch where like it's going to be made for the masses we're all going to have to mentally like <laughs> accept it <laughs> and like it's just gonna completely do a whole 180 and like i feel like that's going to happen sooner than later do you think that would be in our lifetime i think so yeah. i mean everything's happening so fast so fast it's mad yeah. It's yeah, crazy. I feel like the only thing that's stopping us is like our like mentality, like our just how how accepting we are. But like, if you look at Asia, where people already have robots as their pets, and like yeah. don't see a difference between a real dog and a robot dog, like it's all just a mental thing. Like if your brain accepts that as the as the real thing. Well, I guess as human beings, uh, generalizing generalizing, we don't like change, right? And we struggle yeah. with change. So I guess it's like, but then like look at the iphone like look how much that changed the world it changed mm -hmm. everything or the ipod changed music but yeah. the iphone changed the world to a certain 100 percent mm -hmm. um and how one thing can change the whole world and how you look at it like if there wasn't the iphone there wouldn't be any apps there wouldn't be anything like that so it's like we'd be so far behind. And I think one yeah. one amazing invention can kind of change everything. Yeah. I tell you what I can't wait for is teleportation. True. But do you think that, I feel like that's like the one thing that's going to take a little longer. It better be in my lifetime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got to tell the, the science nerds to hurry up. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would give up all, everything to... If I was intelligent enough, which I'm definitely not in that <laughs> that realm of life, I would give up everything if I could, if I knew that I could create a teleportation device. Same, because I feel like, especially as a musician, like the one thing that kind of kills the spirit and like really makes it such a tiring thing too is just all the traveling, you mm. know? You're like, if I could only perform, which is the one thing I love the, doing yeah. the most, and then teleport to the next city. Yeah. Like that would just make everything so much more doable. Also just the sheer amount of time that you would get out of that. Yeah. It would be, I agree with you. it would be insane. It'd be just mm. so good. And like, imagine it, imagine, too. yeah. Like you, we could do this podcast in, in person, right? True. Like, like if there's like, on the beach. Yeah, exactly. We'd be like, where do you want to go today and do the podcast? It's like sick. Yeah. It's amazing. I, I think that would be, yeah, that would be so good. How do you- That'd be like your number one superpower if you had to choose. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. What would yours be? I'm just thinking, I'm like, it's stupid that I'm asking this question because I don't have a good answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe also teleportation or I feel like, I mean, I would love to be able to record my dreams. Wow. I don't know if that's a superpower, but like to just like have like a little gap, like a little camera that you can take with you into your dreams or like even just like be plugged to a device where it just records it all like a movie. I think that would be like the coolest thing. I'd That'd be cool, that. but it would also be pretty dark. I have some pretty dark dreams. Yeah? Yeah. I heard like they've been pretty just like all over the place lately, but a lot of them like I feel like 50% of my songs are all from dreams. No way. Really? Yeah, really cool. Yeah, I That's mean, I wild. dream very visually and I dream like lucid very yeah. often. Um, so I would just like, there's been so many instances where I'm like, this is like so crazy cool. Like if like there's no way I'm ever, anyone else is ever going to understand what this mm. dream feels like or looks like yeah. just by me explaining it because just it's not able to be put into words. Mm. And like for those moments, I feel like that would be just so cool. Do you ever write that? Do you ever write down your dreams? I used to have like a dream diary where I would mm. like write them down whenever I like woke up. The first thing I did was write them down. Yeah. Um, but then I like got more into it. And I also read the more you like, because those are all steps you take to like facilitate the whole lucid dreaming thing. Okay. Um, okay. But then also at the same time, it's kind of like a game with the devil because you're also increasing uh, how like um, your risk like the what's it called um what's this thing called again sleep paralysis okay. you're also like yeah. the more likely you are to lucid dream you the more you, likely you are to get sleep paralysis and i'm so scared of that that i was like okay i've had <laughs> that a couple times anyway so like don't put yourself 
like at more risk than you already are for sleep paralysis and stuff like that. Cause I, I have so many friends that have it and that like scares me to death. Yeah. Um, it's so I stopped gross. doing that, but uh, I do like, can you explain lucid dreaming? Lucid dreaming is just being awake in your, in your dreams. So you can like, okay. you know that you're dreaming, but you haven't woken up yet. So you can yeah. dream whatever you want. I have to say like, for me, like, it's not that easy. Like, I can't just be like, okay, now I want to dream I'm at yeah. the beach and then all of a sudden I'm at a beach. Mm. Like, I feel like you need to be a little bit even more, like more in tune with yeah. your subconscious to be able to do that. But like, you can decide what you want to do in your dreams. You can like give yourself magic powers. Mm. You can teleport. <laughs> and like, I just love, like, I had this one dream. I always tell the story, but like a, a song of mine, Stains, is actually like from a dream where I was in my subconscious like it was like a lucid dream and i was in my apartment and like all of a sudden like in a corner i saw like a little door mm. like kind of like Coraline. and then i like go through that door and um i'm like all of a sudden i'm like in this almost like um like shell shaped uh like room or like big hall um that's like basically like a gallery or like an exhibition of my subconscious. So I had like pictures on the walls yeah. of people that I, all the people that I knew that I hadn't spoken to in ages. I had like, I remember that day I Googled uh, the French word for like a message in a bottle. And like, I had that written there in my handwriting plus the German translation. I had like, like in a huge bottle, yeah. I had um, just like writings on the walls. I had like little like objects from memories that i you know memories of mine i was like this whole like sensory overload and like experience of like my everything i've ever like experienced and like my just my whole memory my whole subconscious and i was just like walking around kind of like exploring it and it was so crazy um that i did end up writing a song about it um but like just dreams like that like if i were just able to record them like that would be yeah That'd I'd be, be the special. happiest girl on the what's, planet. What's your favorite movie? Movie. I have to say, like, I, I'm not super into movies. Okay. I was, I, I was just gonna. I was expecting you to say Inception. And so I love Inception. Yeah. I have to say, I love Inception. But like, I feel like I'm like a very sensitive, mm. and like whenever I watch movies, like it kind of messes again with my dreams, like a little bit. Like, oh, wow. like it's kind of scared like i remember the last movie that i actually watched was um i don't even know was it spider-man yeah like some marvel is spider -Man. i don't know my sister forced me to go like to the movies with her and like i think it was spider-man watched the spider-man thingy and like that night like my dreams were kind of like a mixture of like the spider-man universe mm. and like my own like fantasy universe and then like it kind of fucked me up because i was like how much of this is like my own creation how much is this if this is just like a foreign like whoever the director of the spider-man movie yeah. or whoever like whoever thought of spider-man like how much of this is mine and how much of this is you know another person's fantasy is that and not an amazing kind of, thing like, weirded me out is that it's not kind of cool too is yeah is that not an amazing thing that it, allowing other people's creativity to affect your creativity in a positive way true i mean that is kind of the whole thing of inspiration right yeah so, totally yeah, I, i'm right. a huge movie person huge what's your favorite movie drive okay i haven't seen that one yeah. you should check <laughs> it out I like, it, the soundtrack I, is i'll amazing. put it on my list of movies i want to watch but probably never will because <laughs> <laughs> i'll send you the soundtrack after okay you'll okay. you'll love the soundtrack um okay. and nice. the, i've heard of it i've heard yeah. of drive i just like i the only time i ever watch anything is when i brush my teeth oh really so like I, it's super you got stupid, clean teeth like, so we're good <laughs> Huh? Clean teeth, exactly. Clean teeth, yeah. That's why I always spend two hours brushing my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, that's that's like the only way I can motivate myself to get up and like go get ready mm. for bed. It's like by like, you know, this is like my designated Netflix time. Yeah. Every night is like you know that half hour where I'm getting flossing, yeah, my yeah. teeth, doing my contacts and everything. Um, so I need something that's not like too mentally like challenging because yeah. while you're brushing your teeth, I also have an electrical toothbrush, it's so loud. like it's loud yeah. too. Um, so like Fresh Prince is about the level of complexity that <laughs> <laughs> it can be, but it can't be above that. <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. What the original Fresh Prince or the new one? Is there a new one? Yeah, they've got a new one out. It's, oh my God. Yeah. Why do they keep making like bad remakes of all these classics? I don't know. I think it's supposed to be like almost kind of serious as well. 
And I'm like, the Serious? Fresh Prince. Yeah, like. That's the whole point of that, though. I know, it's pointless. And who's, who pointless. plays the Fresh Prince? I can't remember. I've not seen it. I have, have zero desire okay, but to watch it. It's probably better that way. Yeah, zero desire to watch it. Um, yeah, no, me neither. It's I was, crazy. I was going to say something, but I completely lost track what I was going to say. What were we talking about before Fresh Prince? Oh yeah, um, are you so so you're not a big like YouTuber like watching YouTube watching like anything YouTube like that. I, I, YouTube I do, but like I use YouTube just to when I'm like, because I get this thing where I'm like I I read something that I'm super interested in like yeah. knowing more about, and then I'll spend like a day deep diving on YouTube like finding every bit of knowledge there is about that topic and i think youtube is the perfect platform for that but I, i'm not like i don't have youtubers that i like follow yeah. like watch every video of or yeah so you just I'm dive like, deep into conspiracy theories on youtube and then yeah, and then you go all day every day <laughs> <laughs> what do you what what do you do when you travel how do you kind of buy the travel time um i sleep a lot i think that's like I, the, the thing is like i can never sleep like also not at home but oh, okay. on a plane why is I'm, that I, why? I don't know. I think it's like this like calming thing. It's the same as like as a kid when you were dr dr like your parents were like, you know, taking you on a long road trip. Mm. It was raining outside. Like that was just I felt like it was so Sleeping. easy to fall asleep during, yeah. you know, those car rides. And um, it's the same, I think, on the plane. And like so I, I try to actually to make the because I hate traveling. So to make it go over quicker, I try to not. I mean, I, I don't try to not sleep, but I hardly sleep when I'm anywhere where there's exciting things happening yeah, of course yeah, yeah. and then like so that i'm super knocked out and then i can completely zone off when i'm the moment i step on the plane mm. but the other things i do is i i kind of like i feel like i'm very creative like when i'm on a plane like especially i think because there's no distractions you know yeah um which is also why i'm good that wi-fi isn't like why i'm fine with wi-fi not being a thing yeah, yeah. on planes yet um so yeah, I'll like, I'll write like songs, just like do voice memos. Cool. I'll maybe writing lyrics is I think so easy to do on a plane. Yeah. Um, even producing, but like for that, you need your laptop and like, usually it's just my phone. Uh, so I just love like, you know, using the time where I'm kind of away mm. from everything that's happening down on earth. Do you, do you so travel with your laptop? Huh? Do you travel with a laptop? I try, I mean, I have my live, I'm not a DJ, right? Yeah, so yeah. I like have a live show and yeah. it's all on Ableton on my laptop. So I need my laptop, but it's like my live laptop. So yeah, it's yeah. not my personal laptop yeah. where I have everything mm. on there, but I, it's, it's all right for like, I could be producing stuff, but I don't know. I just, I, I'm like very good with working just with my phone. Yeah. Um. So I'd like to just, you know, completely use that when I can. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. It's, I always like to see what other people do when they're traveling because we spend so much time doing it. Mm. And it's the one thing that I <laughs> can't remember who I was touring with. Um, but they were like, if you can be productive and make and enjoy the travel, your life as an artist, touring artist, will be so much more pleasurable. Oh, it, yeah. Because it's... It, and that's that is the it's one percent of, of the time right well so like my sounds bad but my view is that we get paid to travel we yeah don't, we don't, well, i completely agree yeah, <laughs> we, don't, we don't get paid to do anything else really apart from travel which yeah. yeah like if you're like a massive ticket seller and you can sell th hundreds of that or tens of thousands of tickets like yeah you're paid to you, you're traveling in extreme like a very nice form of travel and it's probably a lot easier to do so um yeah. but yeah i think when you're especially at the beginning of your career and kind of getting to a point you have to put in the hours traveling just like you have to put the hours in the studio and the hours in working how to learn the piano how to learn how to write songs yeah. and ten thousand hours on a plane <laughs> And then, you know, your and life more. really sucks. <laughs> and more. <laughs> it's like once you're a senator or whatever it's called, you're like, okay, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's like when you're like... I made it. It's, it's like when you talk to your friends and they're like, they ask you what you're up to and you're in like four different countries in three days. And you're like... Yeah. like and then and then they complain, like, I don't know how you do it. And you think like, oh, it's just fucking normal. It's just like what yeah. we do. Um, exactly. But, but I feel like that's also like... 
I mean, I love complaining about traveling as much as the next DJ yeah. does. I don't complain <laughs> about it. I don't complain uh, about it. Exactly. I think it's also just so, so cool that it's part of our jobs. Right. Like, I'm like, I mean, I'm still at the beginning. So I still see, like, I'm still excited. Like, I can still get excited by going to a new place and, like, yeah. seeing a new culture, hearing a new language, like, just meeting new people. Um, I know that, like, once you're 10 years in, like, I have so many friends that are, like, Jake. They don't care where they are anymore. They just go straight to the hotel, go straight to the yeah. gig, go to the hotel, go back on the, like the next uh, plane, which yeah. I also understand. But I try to, whenever I have the time, to really make an effort and like go see the city if I haven't been there and like yeah. wake up extra early and like walk around a little bit. Um, so I try to, I don't know. I feel like the num- like the second thing that really inspires me is also just being in new places, which yeah. is why like especially when I'm like in the process of making new albums, like I always try to make it in a new place that I haven't been mm. before. And like, that's cause there's like that stimuli of yeah. like inspiration, like new triggers, new everything. It's just like, it does something to me. Mm. Um, so I think that's like, I, even though the traveling is really annoying, like it does pay off, not just for being on stage, but also just getting to see so much of the planet. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. You, you say that about inspiration. Um, I, I don't, I used to, but I don't really get inspiration from being in different places now. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if I have truly, I think it was just a very easy thing as an artist to say, oh, I get inspired by going to this city or by going to that city. I think it just gets to a point where everyone, a lot of people say it. So it's the case of just agreeing with everyone and cracking on. And I think it's taken me a while to really understand like what truly does inspire me. Um, and it's such a cliche question, but like how does a city, how does a new place, how does that inspire you to write music? Because I, I, th- like- I, I think it's really easy for people to say, yes, it inspires me, but none of us actually talk about like how it inspires us and what the process is of like, the inspiration to then the actual writing of the record and then the finishing of the record. I mean, I, um, I love, I mean, it's so hard nowadays to do anything that's new, right? Because everything has been done. Yeah. So what I love is just combining things that already exist and that maybe haven't been combined that much Mm. before, you know? So like my first ever songs, like at a time I was super like into like really, um, old, uh, church, like songs and I found a way to incorporate them on like the house and techno music that I was making, which is now I think being that like, it's obviously always been done, but like, it's still something that people don't do that much. So I was like, well, this is cool. Like, let me tap into that a little bit more and explore that a little bit more. What type of church songs? Sorry. I want to dig into that quickly before we go into the other stuff, but what type of church songs? Are they like gospel song songs? I love gospel, but the thing is, I like, I know all these terms in German. I don't know what they are in English, uh, but it's like a motete and a madrigal. Madrigal. I I have no idea, but it's like, really really old like not like before the classical period cool um just like the beginnings of church music yeah basically amazing um and i'll send you a few links yeah like please, super, do. please do like it almost sounds like gregorian chants in a way like yeah. it's you know more that type um and the way i like that's the way where when i'm in new cities for example i was just in barcelona um a couple of weeks ago and i went to this like the one church that, or is it a church? I don't know. Like the, um, the famous, like, yeah. I think it's a church. Yeah. It, famous cathedral, church that's yeah, in there. Yeah. What's it called? I forget. What's um, it called? I need to find it. The one that's still being built. Could be. Yeah. I mean, there was, it was definitely under construction. It was like yeah. famous for its architecture. Cause it's, uh, Barcelona. Huh? Um, so it's in Bar. Did you say Barcelona? Barcelona, exactly. Uh, it's cathedral. not cathedral. It's not the cathedral. La Sagra- Sagrada Familia. That's it. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. That's Basilica. It. Yeah. So that's the one I went to. Who was the uh, architect on that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, he's famous. He's a famous. You're asking all the questions. But that um, architect. Of Gaudi. Gaudi. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Gaudi. Exactly. So obviously we knew that. We didn't have to Google that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I went there and I was walking across the street and the church had just opened and there was like, um, like singing coming from the church. And it was like, those, like, it was melodies that I hadn't heard in a long time. Cause yeah. you know how church music, like they use different intervals, like they yeah. use different rhythms. 
and obviously it was also a different language. Um, so I was walking across the street and I heard it. I, I think it was probably coming somewhere from the church. Yeah. Uh, but I like recorded, I like heard it, I recorded it. And then I recorded me kind of trying to sing it, but like purposely not singing the exact same thing, but yeah. kind of already making it my own way and just like recording the reaction that I had in that moment of how that melody mm. kind of got transformed in my brain into another melody. Yeah. And I have the recording and it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like a, a new melody that I can now use on a song. And it was literally inspired by me being in this new place, walking across the street, getting this new impression of this melody that I wouldn't have heard anywhere else on yeah. the globe. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, that's the way that I kind of weave new places into my songwriting and music that's writing. Cool. Do you ever do like field recordings? Where you're like uh, i want to get more into it i just ordered yeah. like a new mic to plug into my phone um i use just the normal mic yeah it's yeah. also good it's right? really good I mean, yeah yeah it's really good and it it seems to work yeah do you do a lot with field recording i record a lot i never use it because i always forget that i recorded <laughs> so it's also like, like on splice i feel like no matter like i was for example i was in a visa and i i stood there recording waves for five minutes and then i go on splice and i look up waves and like the waves just sound so much better on splice <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the day i just take the ones from splice and not the ones that i actually recorded do you know why why they sound better why because the, the, the ai made it Ooh, now we're back to this is like a recurring theme <laughs> <laughs> always circling back to the ai <laughs> yeah controlling our lives um, oh no, you're probably right like there's some type of crazy crazy thing in there probably. that we just don't have access to splice yeah. is a splice is an interesting concept i feel it's like mm. it's changed it's changed the world of music in especially yeah. electronic music um what's your thoughts on it i think it's cool i feel like people that say that you know every sound on your own records has to be produced and like made by yourself and like you can't let you know work other people's work be part of your own stuff yeah. I feel like that's a very restrictive way of looking at it. I think as long as you, I mean, I think the power is still nowadays even more so than ever before because of things like Splice, yeah. not in the creation, but also very much in the curation. Mm. So I think like as a DJ, all you do is you cur curate music all day. And as a producer using Splice, it's the same thing. It's just like on a more molecular basis. Yeah obviously um so i love using it in my productions i try not to go overboard and i try to you know i want to for example i use my voice a lot in my productions mm. um not just as me like singing but also just as like an instrument like yeah. i love kind of making a pad out of it or yeah, something yeah. that like really no one else on this planet has access to yeah. except for myself mm. um so i do try to do things that stand out and like try to um make it make my music unique to my myself yeah but at the end of the day like if there's a cool splice loop or a splice sound that inspires that out of me or inspires me to do anything to build up on it yeah then i don't see why it's so bad to use it even if everyone else has access to it too yeah i agree i think it's it's a uh, i agree with the whole you shouldn't have to write everything yourself and make every sound yourself i think that's just no one does that really yeah because um, i know someone who does yeah but i i guess you could then bring that back to like you have to do everything yourself so you have to yeah. fucking make the, gu the guitar yourself you have to make everything like there's Dude, there's like a level of like yeah and i feel like art doesn't like art isn't created in a vacuum no like so many like those type like so many people that don't want to use bites or also that don't want to be inspired by other artists or like do thing do yeah. what's trendy right now like i get it like you want to do a hundred percent like what's inside of yourself and let it out yeah. but i feel like art is so informed by what's happening in the culture in that type like zeitgeist mm. in the time that you're making the art yeah. um that like that's a very i think again like a very just restrictive way of looking at it like i made my last album uh completely isolated didn't get to road test it and like the i only got to play it live after i'd already handed it in yeah and that was a big mistake because i like i then when i was on the road 
all these things. I started noticing all these things, which yeah. I would have never noticed yeah. if I, you know, just in my little studio yeah. on my headphones. Um, so like now really, I try to inform like really, it's such a, it's such a just craft of marrying both your vision in the studio with the mm -hmm. like vision live for yeah. me nowadays. And that's yeah. like really the two worlds that I always try to be like going back and forth um, between and that's I think a much cooler way to to look at it and mm. to kind of also just get that feeling and it is a culture like dance music is such a culture right and to kind of have that in the music too and not just have it be like you know a production that you made in your on your own yeah. with headphones on uh it's I don't know I feel like it's different it's really interesting though because you're in a kind of a unique situation where you write dance music or electronic music not all not everything you write is that but you're also performing it in a dj setting but you're not a dj mm -hmm. how <laughs> is is have you have you ever dj'd i started dj like i never purely dj'd yeah. i would always do hybrid dj sets yeah. so i'd play like 50 percent my own stuff and then sing when i was playing my own stuff yeah. and then 50 percent other stuff mm -hmm. that was how i began just because of logistics like yeah, it was yeah, just so totally. much easier to travel yeah. with a usb stick yeah. <laughs> and a mic as opposed to like a whole full live setup yeah, yeah. but then at the end of the day like i think it confused a lot of people mm -hmm. and also like i never saw myself as a dj yeah um so like i i'm not the type to spend hours on beatboard like crate digging and yeah, whatever yeah. like i think it's cool that i just don't wouldn't have i think the patience for it and i yeah. just much rather use that time to make something myself totally so good. i like i said i never really saw myself as a real dj um and also i feel like it was sending mixed signals because people were asking me like are you a live artist are yeah. you a dj like what are you doing yeah um and i was like yeah good question like it's it's hard, I think, nowadays because I feel like as soon as you make electronic music, you're automatically a DJ. Yeah. Which um, I think is a little sad, but I mean, it's just part of how things are nowadays. Um, well, I, don't, like, I don't think I think it's just the culture, right? It's like you it make is. you make yeah. you make club records, which is made for the club, and the club is ninety nine point nine percent of the time has a DJ in. Yeah, exactly. And, and and it is so cool to be like as a live live artist, you know, I don't have the I can't react to the crowd like a DJ can. Yeah. So um, for me, like it's I had to make the conscious decision beginning of this year. Do I want to do just DJing or do I want to do just live? Because yeah. there's no way of me doing like the hybrid thing anymore. Like it's too confusing. Yeah. Um, and then I decided, okay, I want this to be 100% my own mm. vision. Like, I just want to play 100% my own music. Mm. I want to be able to play instruments on stage. Like, I want to be able to express myself yeah. uh, on different, with different tools. Um, so whatever, like, I'm, I am going to pay the extra flight and the extra hotel room for a tour, tour manager so yeah. I can carry all my stuff. But it's worth it in the end because I'm investing in something long-term. And, like, I'm building up just this my own world of music and like slowly but surely letting the people into it and it's a good investment so that's the decision i made at the beginning that. of the year which was kind of hard um but i'm really glad i did because now like going back to the creative process like the fact that i have my whole studio on stage with me now has allowed yeah. me to also be so creative on stage and like write new songs mm. write new ideas on stage in that moment yeah. and it's also just allowed me to completely express myself and like completely show people the music that i that i that i make and yeah. like invite them into this language that i speak with my music so yeah that was kind of no, how i decided I, to. I really respect it and i think it's like you're playing the long-term game which i think in this day and age especially a lot of people don't even look at the long-term game and mm -hmm. i think for me looking into other people's careers like you see the rise and the fall of djs of artists of whatever but i think if you're playing the long-term game it doesn't matter about the peaks and troughs in your career because there's a there's a long-term goal and you will eventually get there if you work hard and you write great music and 
it's just a matter of time of when that kicks off and and things grow and you get to where you want to get to. I think as a DJ, when you are just a DJ, I do think there's limits. And I'm a, I'm a DJ, if you know what I mean. Like I've been a DJ since I was 11 years old, 12 years old. And there is limits. Uh-huh. And What are the limits you would say like that? Well, I wouldn't have performing live. Well, I, I, I think the limit, I think you create your own limits as a, as a, as a human, as a person. And I think mm-hmm. the DJ world is very limited to, I play house and techno and that is all I do. Right. And that is all I'm allowed to do. And that's the limit right when you're a live artist and you're and this is just me like i'm not saying this is necessarily the case but like if i was to play like a really chill record halfway through a set Mm -hmm. it might it might work it might not but also it's like there's a level of like you have to keep the club you're you're almost working for the people yeah, it's a, it's a lot more functional, of it, course. Yeah, you're it's a lot more like as an artist, like as a live artist, you have much, you're allowed much more of that, you know, fuck you attitude of, exactly. like, of like, this is what I do, exactly. take it or leave it. Yeah, like, yeah. exactly. This is me. And, and as a DJ, your job is, you're right. Your yeah. job's to entertain. And, exactly. and and I think there's, it's I don't know, I'm just imagining from where you're at in your career, like there's going to be times where, you're playing live and people don't have a fucking clue who you are and mm. and what you do. And they will be pleasantly surprised and some people won't be, if you know what I mean. That's the joy. It's the same as being any artist in the world. But there's something really amazing about that that just, like, speaks... That I just... I haven't experienced myself yet in my career. Whereas, like, I'd love to... Like, my DJ sets are literally 95% my own records. So I'm practically playing a live show, but yeah. it's in a DJ format. But I think like there's a, I don't know what the word, like there's a, a you're like just laying yourself out on the table mm-hmm. and just ready to, there, there's no get out clause. Yeah. There, there's no like, oh, I can just play this big record that everyone's going to respond to. Yeah, it's a lot more vulnerable. Definitely. That's the word I was looking for, vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, you're you're just yeah, and and I think there's something I really respect about that, and also really wish for my own career that I did that to a certain extent. But, um, I mean, you can still. I will. I will. It's in the plans. Nice. Um, nice. But yeah, I yeah. mean, I also, I mean, my now, like you said, like I still play in these DJ situations yeah. where. It's a DJ lineup. Yeah. And then like my music, like all my live says, like the kick never, or I mean, the beat never stops. So like it is very heavily inspired by DJ yeah. culture, definitely. Um, but I mean, the goal is of course to do headline shows and to really have it be like, not just a sonic experience that's a hundred percent my own, but also like everything from how the ticket is designed to yeah. how, what you first see when you entry yeah. the visuals mm-hmm. like the the light like the whole just have the whole experience be 100 yeah. percent my own expression and i think that's something i mean you could debate like if you look at afterlife if you look at solomon like all these big djs they have their own visual team with them now and it, it is almost like a live show sure. in a way where yeah, it's yeah. like and a whole experience and they're still djing and not playing live um but i was always I was because I see myself kind of as like an audiovisual artist. So I like I love being like expressing myself as much through visual uh, as audio content, yeah. like for the whole album, because because I like so many songs come from dreams. Like I do like I did like a whole animation project mm. uh, where I even like really sketched out some of the dreams that I had and then turned them into animations. That's cool. So I think just to be able to like combine all of that live as the medium for me yeah um i also think that i mean as a dj you're right like you have the power of playing dropping a hit song or i don't know uh, like really responding to the crowd but there's something about the 
human voice i think that is just like it's so emotional like you can capture an audience if you use it at the right time like in the right moment um and it's such a different just level of emotionality like compared to Mm. that a dj could ever achieve obviously because it is you know the human voice Yeah, yeah um so that's almost, I mean, it's also hard because clubs aren't made for vocals. Like there's always no. feedback issues. Like, and also I think at 5 a.m. in the morning, no one wants to hear a voice. Like, you know, no one wants to hear you sing. Um, but, I think, <laughs> but I feel like it can be a highlight. And um, I love like having fun with that. And it's also a surprise. I mean, I love surprising people. I think music is all about surprising mm. people. And like um, most people, like when I first, when I sing the first few notes, they're like, what? like they're like i can see them like looking around like what's she saying like i don't get it and like it's just cool to kind of you know yeah i guess the whole live thing in a club is different as well right you don't often like live i look at live music as like a band right or like you go see a band Um, i've obviously got a lot of friends that do live djs or live sets in a club um i'm my own band yeah it's really amazing (laughs) what we can do with technology because yeah like i chemical brothers are like one of my favorite bands faithless are like it's very different because faithless i don't know if you do you know faithless i chemical brothers i know i like i've heard of them yes yeah so with like faithless they make electronic they made electronic music still do i i guess Mm -hmm. um huge in the 90s and early 2000s but like they when they performed live they had a full band and Mm. it was like they had like eight people on stage like performing which was amazing to see especially uh, amazing to see like electronic music performed in a way like that and then on the other spectrum where you go to see chemical brothers where we know that it's all being played off like backing track but they have some sort of control with synths and MIDI and things like that. But it's such a visual experience. Yeah. And it's very, it's very immersive and it's very like, it's amazing. And I think this, that's the amazing thing is like, yes, with afterlife, right. They're the the kind of people right now that are just creating the most amazing visuals for a DJ setting, but still like it, there's still something lacking to me in that sense where it's it takes yeah i do people go to that party because they enjoy the music or do they go to that party to see the visuals and take photos of the of the visuals whereas like when you're going to see a live artist it's like i'm going to see for the whole experience yeah which yeah. i love i love so i really respect it <laughs> So, yeah so no work. you're right like does it take away from that does it take the focus off of the music yeah. of course but then again if you see yourself also like bringing it again more back to ai and the metaverse like if you look <laughs> at <laughs> the future in the metaverse like i just went to my first um vr rave in la wow uh, and that was such a crazy experience but it was so immersive and like yeah. after five minutes your brain just accepts Switches, it as yeah. the new reality and like i was dancing on like I I was shrinking myself, growing myself. I was flying around. I was dancing on mushrooms. There was like a button where you could uh, like physically physically on mushrooms, and like there was a button that you could press, and then all of a sudden, like on the dance floor, all of these like noodles would appear, like colorful, like basically like pasta noodles, and they were like <laughs> wiggling and like dancing around. Like it was so like it was so crazy, and like you were even able to take drugs in that already extremely trippy world, which was like next level like it was so crazy and like i think if you because visuals have become like next to the music Mm. so like i said immersive and like so much part of it if you really build up a live show that's known both for the music and the visuals like and then translate that into the new medium that we're all bound to be gravitating towards which is the metaverse yeah then that can really you know completely blow everything out of proportion and it can be such a huge thing that you would never be able to experience Mm. or like create with just music. So I think in a way it's just like preparing maybe your fan base or like preparing the people for what's to come in the future and like opening up, opening up that gateway again already of creative expression. No, I totally agree. Question about VR Raven. 
How does it sound? So crazy good. Like really good and also realistic. Like it was like if you turned around in the, in the metaverse, like the music, it would like it was like a forest rave. And like you could walk around in the forest yeah. and like the music would really Change. feel like 4D audio. Yeah. Type, like where like if it was on the like if it was far away on the left, you would only hear it on your left ear. And like if you were climbing up a tree, like it would all of a sudden come from like the what's what's it called? Like the audio placement yeah, was just yeah, yeah. 100% accurate. The sound quality, I mean, it was a VR, VR you know, headset. So uh, obviously okay. that can always be yeah. improved. But like just like the spatial, like it all feels so realistic. Yeah. And like they even like it was like the guy told me like it was all like an algorithm basically that was yeah. at every part of the game calculating where you are right now, what's standing like around you that could reflect music in the real world wow. world and how what type of sound would that produce and then really emulating that on your headset. So well fucked. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> Yeah, because that's the one thing about, I was, again, talking about that yesterday um, with the whole AI conversation. But, like, it's there's still, for me, something about that human connection and feeling the speakers. Like, mm -hmm. the, some of my best memories are walking into a venue and just feeling the sub bass. Yeah, and I know it becomes something. very physical at some point. Yeah, and it's it's not necessarily even about, it's the anticipation like it's being outside the venue and hearing like someone opening the door and you hear it out and it's like that anticipation of going in and like experiencing it. And I, I maybe it, maybe we will change with the whole VR thing. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, for me, it was interesting because I feel like the whole COVID thing, first of all, like I agree with the physical thing, yeah. but I think that can be solved with body suits, suits, which are already a thing. Right. So yeah. like, if you're wearing a bodysuit and wearing the VR headset, like he headset, yeah. everything becomes 100% replicable yeah. um, in the VR in the VR space. But I think like virtual clubbing in general, because um, my first gigs they were all uh, streaming gigs, which is such a sign of the times. Because I started in 2020, wow. So like the first, like it was a weird experience. Like my first ever gig was actually like a a gig where I was playing in a virtual club. And then mm. after that, I could go to the club and see myself play. So like cool. it was super weird. And like, I obviously didn't enjoy it having those be my first gigs. Cause yeah. I remember like the first time I was actually playing in front of people. Like it was like, it was together with Buka shade and it was like this weird, like, like, you know, post COVID, but not really where yeah. there were like couches set up and everyone had their little radius of like mm. a meter that they could were able to like allowed to move yeah. in. And like, it was still super weird. And like from that, then like working my way to the first concerts where are like shows where people were standing and they all had their designated like X's on the ground. And if yeah. they ever moved from that X, like, you know, they were kicked out. And then at some point, which was the most stupid, I think was that they were allowed to stand, but they weren't allowed to dance, which I'm like, COVID's not going to spread more. It's crazy. If you dance. It's like, crazy. It's, you know, that's yeah, not yeah. how viruses work. Um, but yeah, so I like, I obviously really enjoyed then playing my first gigs yeah. in front of a real crowd yeah. that didn't have any limitations on movement and everything. But my little sister, she's uh, 14 and like, she was 12 when COVID began, I think, yeah. um, or, or 11. I don't know. But like that is such a, you know, from 12 to 14, those are like the years I feel like, well, yeah. where so much just happens also in social development. Mm -hmm. And like you go out with your friends for the first time, yeah. like you make all of these like very important experiences for the first time. And I feel like if you miss out on making those, which my sister did, yeah. um, and make them through another, like on another uh, like another way, like she did, for example, she wouldn't meet up with her friends in real life. They would meet up on Fortnite, yeah. or like she wouldn't, yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. she was being homeschooled. So she was just behind the screen all day, every yeah. day. And like, but there was a point where they were allowed to meet up again and they, they were like, okay. So they like made, made a, made a play date, uh, went to their play date. And then like, they came back a half hour later and my sister was like, no, we didn't want to be together like in real life because we wanted to see each other on Fortnite, and my friend only has one playstation at home so i have to come back home so that we can be on Fortnite together wow. and i was like whoa that's like they preferred you know because it was just the new norm for them to be 
meeting on the virtual in the virtual space rather than the real yeah. life space. And I feel like if you grow up with that, and if that's your new understanding of normality, then you don't really have maybe don't really have that desire that we have because we know the real thing of like really going clubbing and really you know like experiencing it like it is because there are many especially for a little maybe socially anxious like there are so many pros to doing it virtually where you can be in the comfort of your own home you can choose which strangers you want to talk to and then you can always opt out of the conversation you can look however you want to look yeah you can you know there's so many cool things about it that we that we feel like would never ever like Matter. even if you add them all yeah, up yeah, yeah, it yeah. wouldn't come close to the real thing yeah. but like i feel like if if that's all you know then that can be a really that can be a really like a viable way for you to do clubbing in the future well it's 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 like anything right it's like people growing up it's like what we're talking about with social media at the beginning it's like what you grew up with it's like there's people now that grew up with iphones that didn't know before mobile phones they didn't know yeah. like I was at the gym this morning and they uh, there's a school connected to the gym and they d- were doing like a a, P, uh, a gym class. Like all the kids were on their phones during gym class. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, you're supposed to be exercising. Like <laughs> what? why have you got your phone at the gym whilst you're at school? Cause, exercising their thumbs. Yeah, because me looking back, <laughs> if we had a mobile phone, like it was like a flip phone at school and like it would be taken off you if you got caught with it. And then I'm like, oh, hang on a minute. I'm at the gym watching YouTube as well. And I'm exactly in exactly the same situation. There's no difference between me and them apart from they're at school. And it's like, yeah, like, I guess it's just culture changes and certain things happen in the world that that kind of influence culture. And exactly. It's this constant need to be stimulated, you know? Yeah, I I think it's like the simplest tasks anymore. That's just how it is nowadays without totally, totally something playing, multitasking and like it just becomes the new norm. Yeah. It's wild. It's wild. Yeah. I think there's a lot of pros and cons to everything. And I think Definitely. realistically, you just got to do what makes you happy. I know. But I feel like like I need to force myself. Like I, I just had this conversation with a friend. Like I feel like sometimes you just need to force yourself to do what's officially better for you like totally. i could spend like the next hour on tiktok or i could force myself to go on a walk and totally. like clear my head and like even though initially like that is a lot harder for me to do it's a lot more of a challenge to yeah. you know put on my coat and everything and then step outside but yeah. i feel like afterwards it always yeah, like you feel so much better and always. i feel like you just have to ask yourself a lot like how is that going to make me feel afterwards totally. Totally. before you start going on a tiktok deep dive or whatever and it's hard I'm, um, I'm like a huge advocate for that. It's like, just really do some, do stuff that you actually, that like challenge you every single day. And I know that sounds cliche as fuck, but it's like, wake up. I make myself go to the gym every single day. And it's not because I'm the fittest person in the world, but it's because I know that if I work my ass off at the gym as hard as I possibly could, like, there's nothing that's going to be harder that day to deal with. And I've yeah. dealt with the hardest thing. And it's like in the studio yesterday, like we, I, I was writing with somebody else. We had like, we worked on this, we, we did three ideas for a record and we worked hours on it and then had to come back and eventually got there. But like, if yeah. you really push through for the hard shit, it makes everything else so feel, feel so good when you're done. And I, you're so right. You're so right. It's super important. And I, I, also habit building right i mean i feel like we spend 90 percent of our days on autopilot anyway yeah. so yeah. like i feel like you know 90 percent of it is subconscious and yeah. those ha- habits that you build no matter how small they are yeah. and like even challenging like it's such a big word like like i said like going out on, on a walk is already a ch- I, view, I view it as a challenge already yeah. even though it's obviously not a hard thing to do um <laughs> but like just like challenging yourself in those little things and really building those habits yeah. to then again like integrate them into your routine um yeah. i feel like that's like really the the key to mastering life i totally agree and that is a perfect way to wrap this motherfucker up um thank wow. you how long have we been talking uh hour and a half oh wow okay it's gone quick nice gone pretty quick <laughs> um how can people follow you 
Uh, I'm Joplin Berlin on all social media. So J-O-P-L-Y-N and then B-E-R-L-I-N. And then on Spotify, it's just Joplin and Apple Music. And like, you can listen to my music under just Joplin, which is J-O-P-L-Y-N. It's amazing. Go listen. Um, thank you so much for coming on. It was I've really enjoyed this. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed it too. I feel like we could have gone on for ages. I know. We... I would carry on going, but I'm record <laughs> I'm recording four podcasts today and I've got another one in twenty minutes. Oh wow. Okay. So, you really Yeah, I've got a lot wow. of it's like it's a factory line today. Um wow. but yeah, thank you so much. Thanks we should taking the time. No, thank you for having me. Um having me. Thanks for coming on. Um <laughs> This is my podcast. Yeah, this is your podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Joplin <laughs> podcast. Um, in future, when you've got new music coming out, I know you've just had a new release out on Watergate, um, but when you've got a new album, please come and talk about it. I'd love to kind of talk more process of music. Um, yes, true. We kind of steered around that today. That's There's the best thing. That's about. the best thing. Yeah. There's like... You exactly, because that's what that. I always talk about. So exactly. this is very refreshing. I listened, <laughs> I listened to a few interviews beforehand of you uh -huh. previously. And I was like, there's a lot of music talk, so we don't need to talk about music so much. It's like people, yeah. people can get that. AI all the way. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> going to think I'm a big conspiracy theorist. And conspiracy theorist. theorist. <laughs> <laughs> the, clip, the, clip I'm gonna, the clip I'm gonna use is like you exactly. talking about conspiracy theories. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, keep safe yeah. and I'll see you soon. Big love. Big love. And that is a wrap. Big love for everybody listening. Thanks for coming on Joplin and please hit subscribe and give us a little review. Keep safe. Till next time.